The Jain Caves comprise the last great group of caves at Ellora. They are a set of five caves, numbered 30 to 34, located at the northernmost end of the site, about half a mile away from the other larger groups of Buddhist and Hindu caves. These caves, whose decoration dates perhaps to the late 9th or early 10th century AD, are dedicated to Jainism, one of the three great religions of India, all of which are represented at the Lora in a profusion of cave temples, sculptures and relief carvings. Cave 30 is the first of the Jain caves and may have originated as a Hindu temple under the Rashtrakuta dynasty, in the latter part of the 10th century AD. Located at a slightly higher level than most of the other caves, Cave 30 appears today as a huge unfinished excavation, containing but the shell of what would have been a grand freestanding rock-cut temple. Because of its similarity to the great Kailasha temple, but owing to its smaller size and unfinished state, this cave is commonly known as Chota Kailash, meaning the little Kailash. Like the great Kailash temple, it is entered through a low rock-cut gopura, leading into a portico in front of the temple proper. A large, open-air courtyard surrounds the temple on all sides, although here the work is unfinished and comparatively very crude. The pit measures less than half that of the Great Kailash Temple, at about 40 meters or 130 feet long, by 25 meters or 80 feet wide, with two rather crude and unfinished excavations on both sides. The temple itself has a square mandapa, supported by 16 massive monolithic pillars. The sanctum is empty, except for a pedestal that would have once supported a lingam. Most of the sculptures appear to be dedicated to the cult of Indra, rather than of Shiva, and include the representations of dancers and musicians. The temple may thus have been conceived as a representation of the celestial paradise, filled with a variety of heroes and heavenly beings. In its present state, this temple only contains the top story and is lacking a ground floor or pedestal, suggesting that work stopped at the rather early stage of carving. Perhaps owing to its unfinished state, however, it allows us to better understand how these huge rock-cut monuments were carved from the top down, by cutting deep trenches on the sides until only a central monolithic plinth remained. It is possible that Cave 30 was started as a Hindu temple, but remained unfinished and was later redecorated and repurposed as a Jain temple. Following the same trail from Cave 30, one reaches the next group of Jain Caves. Cave 31 is another unfinished excavation. A narrow rock-cut path leads to a large open-air courtyard, on whose eastern side opens a beautifully carved and decorated four-pillared entrance porch. In spite of its incompleteness, or perhaps because of it, this cave is of extreme interest for understanding how the larger cave temples were carved from the living rock.
All around the temple and in the courtyard may be seen the tool marks left by axes and chisels, and larger rectangular depressions from which the rock was removed, perhaps with the use of wedges. The temple itself contains but very few sculptures and a pair of beautifully decorated pillars, which offer a sharp contrast with the otherwise crudely carved and unfinished interior, with only a small carved altar decorated with ascetic figures being the only obviously Jain element in this temple. A little farther along, a set of three more caves, numbered 32 through 35, open at the northernmost end of the cliff. These were some of the latest caves to be built at the Lora, and although significantly smaller than some of the other Hindu and Buddhist caves at the site, with the lack in size, they more than compensate with the richness and variety of their sculptural decoration. Cave 32, also called Indra Saba, contains some of the most elaborate carvings at the Ellora Caves. Rather than a single cave, this appears to be a set of interconnected excavations, lacking a precise plan. The center of the court is occupied by a monolithic chapel, with an 8 meters high column on its left-hand side and an elephant on its right. Large pillared holes framed by elegant verandas open on each side of the court, making this cave's floor plan even more confusing the holes on the second floor may be entered also through nearby Cave 33. Located just beside the Indra Saba, Cave 33 is the second largest in the Jain group of caves. It is preceded by a much smaller court, which had once contained sculptures that are now completely destroyed. Besides the entrance porch of Cave 33, opens a huge pillared hole. From there, a narrow corridor connects with the second floor of Cave 32. This consists of a massive pillared hole with highly ornate columns and exceedingly fine sculptures of meditating Jainas and the 24 Tirtankaras, or saviors, of Jainism. According to Jainist beliefs, 24 Tirtankaras, prophets and spiritual teachers of mankind, appeared over the course of millions of years, the last in order of time being Mahavira, the Buddha, in the 6th century BC. Numerous other carvings adorn this temple, including a colossal image of Matanga, the Jain god of prosperity, and the mother goddess Ambika, sitting on her lion under the mango tree. Unlike the other Hindu and Buddhist caves, whose design obviously served specific ritual or habitational purposes, there are very little hints as to the function and use of these Jain cave temples. In spite of all the richness of their decoration, their general plan is confusing and almost compressed, as if arising rather by accident than as the result of a well-conceived design, with newer caves and corridors often intersecting older ones. It 
it is quite possible that this case, like so many others at the site, may have originated in an antiquity far more remote and were only converted and adapted to the religion of Jainism at a much later time. The Elora caves were clearly created and remained in use over a long period of time, often combining elements from different religions or being appropriated by others. This is particularly evident in some of the Hindu caves adapting earlier Buddhist viharas or in the confusing and rather chaotic design of the Jain caves. With only a handful of inscriptions allowing to date the carvings inside the caves, the chronology and sequence of the Elora caves remains highly problematic. Even more so since the few inscriptions that are found inside the caves may only serve to date when their decoration was completed, but not the time of their construction. The available evidence suggests that many earlier sculptures were either recarved or completely removed when a new religion took over a certain cave, making it all but impossible to determine when the caves were first carved or by whom. There is then also the question of whether the Buddhist Hindu and Jain caves were all in use at the same time, which would suggest a rather pacific cohabitation of the three major religions of ancient India at the site, or rather reflect an occupational sequence in which one religion took over and completely replaced the previous ones. Many legends circulate on the possibility that a vast subterranean city extends far below the caves that are known to the thousands of tourists who visit the Lora every day. The accesses to these hidden caves are either blocked or too narrow to allow even the passage of a small child. The legends seem to find confirmation in the numerous unexplained holes and ventilation shafts they may be seen in some of the caves, reaching down to some unknown depths, and in the extremely narrow tunnels that from the lower levels of the Alora Caves appear to stretch far into the darkness, without any visible outlet nor the least hint as to how these tiny passages could have been carved in the hard basalt rock, where not even a child would fit. But perhaps the greatest mystery of all remains that of how the larger caves were carved and what happened to the hundreds of thousands of tons of rock that were removed in the process. For all their decorative richness and refinement, the later caves appear to be but crude copies of the earlier cave temples, known coming even close to the splendor and architectural perfection of the great Kailash temple. The Kailash temple remains an unsurpassed achievement of megalithic engineering, the secrets of its construction being all but forgotten in the following centuries. No more rock-cut temples would be built after the 9th and early 10th century AD, a fact that may only be partially attributed to the rise of Islam and the Muslim conquest of large parts of northern and southern India. Ellora is both the last and the greatest of the Indian rock-cut monuments, a silent memorial, meant like the Egyptian pyramids to defy the millennia, upon which neither nature nor men seem to hold any power. <laughs>